Hi, this is Leland Chi, creative executive at Lucasfilm, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. Where in the blasted galaxy did that pirate abandon us? And why are you keeping me here? You'd prefer we take you back to that Imperial labor camp instead? The shuttle's bound to be reported missing soon. Assuming we're not captured or killed during this little mission, what assurances do I have that you'll let me go? You're going to have to trust us. Just like we have to trust you. The control room is up ahead. We can access the station manifest from there. Just do your thing and get us inside. We'll handle the rest. That's do your thing, sir. I don't think so. The proximity sensors haven't been deactivated yet. This isn't going to work. Their proximity sensors will detect us and shoot us down. Relax. Echoes on it. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Once more, unto the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. Hello, everybody. This is Dan Zare. Welcome to another episode of Coffee with Kenobi. We are here to talk about the latest episode of Star Wars The Bad Batch. It is episode 13, titled Into the Breach. The uh, the brief little snippet I read today is from Henry V, Act Three, Scene One of William Shake of William Shakespeare, um, and I picked that because it reminds me, not on accident, of this title. So, if we're starting out with an English theme, we've got to have two people on the show who know how to break stories down and know how to break things down. So, first, the uh, I borrow a line from Aaron Harris and Star Wars Reactions. He is the Ezra to my Canaan, Mason Z. Mason. I'm so excited to hear you talk about this. Welcome back to the show, as always. Thank you. It's great to be back, William. Thank you. Oh, I'll take it. I'm happy to be called William. Also joining us, uh, because there's some some Shakespeare stuff in here, albeit not a ton, but enough to really tantalize, you can't just have one English teacher. No, no. You've got to have two. So also joining us, returning guest, easy for me to say, and great friend of the show, as well as the host of Reading Between the Reels, Craig Dickinson. Craig, welcome back. Dan, I'm so glad to be back. And and my English teacher heart grew three sizes as I heard the Shakespeare, because I immediately went to that too. I'm like, yes, that's a Shakespeare reference immediately. So yes, so excited about that. How and how could you not? So before we break it down, let, let's uh, give one word and overall thoughts on the episode. And Craig, we'll just start with you since you are um, the guest, tell us what you tell us a letter grade and overall reactions to the episode. Okay. Uh, on the letter grade, if I don't letter watch grade that, over, uh, okay. sorry, one word, that? one, one word. word. Okay, good. Okay. One I got that both, got both ready. So my one word I'm going to say is impending. And I think it's, I've chose that word because there's a lot of things being set up. I mean, a lot of this season has kind of been long form storytelling. Mm-hmm. And but this episode really feels like a lot of pieces are kind of locking into place, and we're about to see some big conflicts get resolved. Maybe, maybe, maybe. All right, uh, excellent, Mason. Uh, what about you? Okay, my one word is ninjas because you have these two scenes that you're flipping between, and in the Bad Batch one, there you have to sneak around, and in the Omega one, she has to sneak around to make sure. Nobody sees her at all. So that's why my word was ninjas. That's great. I hadn't that Craig had a big smile on his face. Yeah, that's I when fantastic. That. That's pretty slick. I love it. I love it. Uh, well, remind me at the end of the show, we're going to make a plug for something that's not Star Wars later that Mason has been really into uh, different animated series. We're just going to talk about it really briefly at the end because it'll be fun. My one word is a hyphenated word. Thank you, Corey Club. The word is white knuckled. The first time I watched this episode, that last five, six minutes, I was I was practically sweating. I was so nervous. They built the suspense and the terror. And, you know, you just know this plan has to work. It's an impossible plan over with overwhelming odds and very questionable allies. And so in the very end, it is just an absolute stunner. 
So it's white knuckle for me all the way. All the way. So as we talk about this episode, and we can go anywhere, I, I'm going to explain that that Henry V quote. So the episode, again, is called Into the Breach. And Craig, of course, feel free to jump in here. So uh, in Act 3, Scene 1 of Henry V, the very first thing, and usually in Shakespeare's plays, Act 3 is when things are at their most fever pitch. Right, This is where they build and build the rising action. Um, usually the climax occurs around Act 3 and everything after that uh, is a result of this major, major thing. So this speech uh, that I read the beginning of is called the St. Crispin's Day speech. It's extremely famous monologue and a, mon for a soliloquy in Shakespeare is when one person is on stage. They're sharing their thoughts with the audience, but no one in the play can hear it. It's just them sort of espousing how they feel. But a monologue is where you're on stage and you just give a speech. And these lines are to inspire this, these English soldiers, these brave English soldiers who are very outmatched against thousands of French knights. So they have to really be inspired. And, and I'll just read a little snippet. Again, it's once more under the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the walls up with our English dead. So in other words, if in, into the breach means you're going to break into the enemy's camp which is what happens in this episode. They, the Bad Batch, Clone Force 99, is breaking into the space station, hovering above Coruscant. And if they don't, it's going to be bad news. It's going to be the end of their plan because they're going to lose Omega. In Henry V, they say, if we don't break into this camp, then our, our English will be dead. So then it says, in peace, and don't worry, this isn't going to be a whole Shakespeare thing, although Craig and I would be okay with that. Well, he says, in peace, there's nothing... There's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears that imitate the action of the tiger, stiffen the sinews, conjure up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage. And it goes on and on. It's just this beautiful thing about, look, uh, in essence, I'll translate for you. In essence, look, in peace, it's great to be humble and quiet and chill. But when it's war, you've got a heart in your hearts. Your nerves must be as steel. You must fight like a tiger and this is how hard they're going to fight to rescue Omega. And it's pretty inspiring. So that just that little title right there, all these titles throughout the, the season have been pretty telling. Uh, and Craig, I'm not sure how much you want to add, but if there's anything you want to add to this. But when I heard that, I was quite excited. They were taking a, one of the most famous scenes about an impending war and this huge battle and very much setting the stage for us. Yeah, I mean, to, for me, it just lended that extra level of gravitas. Like to, to pull, like you don't, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't pull on Shakespeare lightly mm -mm. You're, that you're going to do that. So I knew we were going to get something pretty tense, and and I would agree. Just that that last few seconds, the <laughs> was white knuckles a great word word for that. I was like, I cannot believe how much. I mean, it's a cartoon, yes, but it's really, really well done. It's what done so well that I'm feeling actual emotions about this. It sucked me in. So kudos. Yeah. Yeah, and let, let's just talk about the ending right now because to me that that's the best part about this thing. You've you've got these two stories as Mason talked about uh, with his his word ninja, where Omega is sharing with these three, and it's Sammy, Eva, and Jax, right? Mm -hmm. Mason is my expert when it comes to Star Wars names, and so she's telling them and trying to inspire them. And she's not saying once more onto the breach, but she is saying, "I've got training." I've had friends that have helped me and we're going to get out of here. Here's the way. And then she sort of in, in starts to empower them and makes them believe. And then on the other part of this, while it seems much more dire, um, it, well, actually, before we get to the other part of it, how is it that Omega is able to be so confident in this circumstance? What do you guys think about that? Mason, what do you think? Yeah, just how cool she has to be, basically cool as a cucumber, to like not be like, oh no, I'm in this and I'm not going to escape, but she still has hope. She does still have hope. Uh, Craig, what, what is it about her that give, makes her so calm, cool, and collected? I, I, I find her endlessly just dynamic and terrific. Yeah, there was a different level of confidence, I think, this time too for me. Uh, the fact that she mentioned, I've had training, and brought that up to me. That's what stuck out, stuck out that the time that she has spent with the bad batch has really prepared her for this, that she's not just going to fly off the handle. She, 
doesn't she has an actual plan she knows what needs to be done and will do it really deliberately because she's either done things like this or been told things like this it's been demonstrated for her so mm-hmm. it's warranted confidence in my opinion it is it is she she is someone that she's seen more things than anyone her age would have a right to but regardless of that there is a belief there's this quiet inner strength and it's not really bravado. I think in here and Mason, what do you think about this? I feel like she realizes that if she has confidence, she's going to help give these kids peace of mind. Yeah, I agree with that. Cause they're like, we're never going to escape. It's impossible, but she gives them hope to try to escape. And she shows repeatedly that she is very, very capable of that. Uh, and it's not even necessarily something she's proven yet. I mean, we know what she is like because we've seen it over and over again. But these kids don't. They have no reason to believe her, but they also have no reason not to believe her. I mean, at, at this point, why not? Because, again, the Empire's cruelty, keeping kids captive and using them. Uh, I think it's so interesting that they use these puzzles to constantly engage their minds. I mean, they're still going to give blood samples regardless of if their minds are engaged or not. But I think that is kind of interesting that they want to do that. Craig, you're obviously an educator. Can you see a benefit to this? Is, is this going to, I mean, if you gave your kids a bunch of puzzles for 24 hours a day, I think they might get, <laughs> I think they might riot. <laughs> yeah. It seems to be placating them though. Mm-hmm. You know, that they, they seem very docile. They want us to do the puzzles. Like they've kind of just accepted their fate and they've given them something. Whereas I think if you don't give them anything, then you, then you have, which we've seen some of that, like the, the escape attempts and things like that. So mm-hmm. they seem to be challenging games enough where they're going to spend a little bit of time on them. But uh, my favorite thing with the game, though, is just to see how Omega used the game to set up. Here's my plan, which I thought was pretty pretty great. Macy, you want to explain that to us, how she does that? Yeah, she like uses the cir- she just has a circle and she uses those as the walls. And then she basically puts a triangle. She says, this is us now because there's three tables and she made them in the shape that they are. And then she says, these are the places that the droids um, put the blood samples and she marked them. And she said, this is our way out. And and the empire, the scientists have no idea what's going on. Um, I, I, again, at the beginning of this, I, I just can't emphasize enough how wonderful that is. And if you're listening, obviously, you know, too, but, the fact that they're waiting for those proximity sensors to turn off. They're waiting and waiting for echo. Um, and we don't even see if it actually, you see him start to crank um, the, the port, the port to try to turn these things off. And Hunter just goes full bore ramparts, losing his mind. They go upside down. And just as they clamp those magnetic clamps s- set up, they zoom to light speed because there's no way they can, take those coordinates because they get uploaded directly to the craft. And then it just goes dark and it's over. I mean, Craig, how did you feel at the end of that? What, what was going through your mind? Well, the first thing I thought the, when they had that last close up on Omega's face, I thought that was going to be the end. Me too. Cause that would have, that would have been fine. And then you give us this last thing that was so tense. Uh, again, going back to the white knuckle thing and then to have that payoff immediately after that. And I just love Hunter's attitude. He's like, no, I'm just going for it. Like it doesn't matter. This is the last chance we have. If they find us, they find us. But we, you know, we don't have a choice here. One of my favorite things about Bad Batch this season is every when this when these episodes end, I always say out loud, "Oh," because you have to wait another week. I mean, it's just it's such a great ending, Mason. What you remember how you felt when you saw this one end? Yeah, when I saw it, when he was rotating the ship so they could hook up, um, I was like, "This is too slow." And it like started to go on light speed right before he hooked it up. And I was like, oh no. And because like how slow it was rotating, I was like, why isn't he going faster? And it's, it's just, it's really, it's really great. Like you said, with it's the animation, it's a, it's a cartoon and yeah, it just takes your breath away. So that, that's the first one. I talked a lot about that one, but I, I just think it's fabulous. And again, the juxtaposition that Mason mentioned of having two stories that are very suspenseful at the same time. But Mason, what, what's something that really jumped out to you or stood out uh, in this episode that, that you think is important to discuss? Yeah, let's just talk about how Omega started to make like that dent in that wall 
where she was talking about how the droids put the medicine in there, and she like looks up there, and then it just um like has basically a place where you would put a commercial, and then um <laughs> it shows uh, her sitting in like the bench thing in her cell, basically cell, and the doctor scolder comes in and is like, "What happened?" And then she's like, "Is anything wrong?" And that that to me that was also suspenseful. It's like that sort of remind me of Escape from Alcatraz, the Shawshank Redemption, where something is going on in the cell. You're trying to figure out a way to escape, and it looks like they're about to be busted. And then uh, Doctor Scalder comes around the corner, and everything's put back in place. It's again, this is a very suspenseful episode. I know some people were a little mixed on on Juggernaut the we, the episode before, which I I don't quite. I don't feel that way, but I, I can't imagine being disappointed with this because the amount of, they're not jump scares, but the amount of suspense that is thrown our way again, makes us, <laughs> makes us terrific viewing. Yeah. Just to kind of build on that, that we don't get to see Omega clean up the mess. So mm-hmm. we have that extra built tension that it's, you know, we're kind of looking over a scalder's shoulder almost like in that, in that, in that point of view. So. So yeah, if, that's, if well, so what about this, Craig? If we saw her fumbling and trying to put them back, and they kept falling down, yeah. uh, that would have played. Yeah, but I don't know that I, I don't know that that would have worked for me because I just don't feel like Omega would lose her cool. And do we need it, that from her? No, we, it, it, we can imagine that that was happening. We can have we can have our cake and eat it too in that situation. We just get to mm-hmm. see the result and get to see her being almost kind of smug. I'm sorry. Was there was there a problem? Kind of, you know, kind of attitude. And by the way, like I would be a terrible imperial prisoner. No blanket. Is that even? Is that a mattress? Is it a, is it a wall bench? Come on! Like do they, they, if they want people to be happy and good prisoners, give them a blanket, right? Am I right, Mason? Yes. Okay, <laughs> uh, Craig. T- uh, what are some things that step out, jump out for you in this episode? So the biggest thing overall with this is that if you were to write a synopsis of this episode, it's not very long, Mm -hmm. but it is represented visually and with the music in a way that just amplifies what, what would be on the page. So there are just some amazing visuals. One of the, that I really loved was there's this bird's eye view of, we could see the top of Mount Tantus, which we had never seen that view before. And then they, right after that, we get to see that it's like concentric circles. Then you see more concentric circles inside and, you know, I have to be, again, the, the language, the language arts teacher in me is like, what's the symbolism of the circle, right? It's like yes. death and rebirth. This is where, you know, this is where Project Necromancer is happening. That, and then all of the quick close-ups of, of Omega uh, trying to break into with the little pick and or when she stole the pick too, all of that very quick. Here's what she's looking at. It's so cinematic. Mm-hmm. I mean, I said cartoon, but it's not, it's really not. It is an animated television show that is shot in a way as if, as if it is a film. So I'm just continually amazed at, with the shadowing and all of those things, just how cinematic it is. Uh, that was actually my next point. I think there are so many sequences from space. Whenever you get Coruscant as a background, I think that just lends itself because it's a, it's a massive planet cityscape. And anytime they show out anything in space in this episode, I feel like I'm looking at a Ralph McQuarrie concept painting. I mean, I really do. This is, this is it. We say that the animation is great. It's tremendous in this. It's tremendous. And there's a ton of cinematography. I know you talk about that a lot on your podcast. In fact, that's one of the main things you, that the, you all talk about when you start the show, but the scene you're talking about with the, the, with the three circles, they pan up and they see it from above. And there's a, that cityscape with some, some, walls and then there are a couple of birds floating by and then they they do a quick jump edit wise into the vault and there's also three circles that match up beautifully and you know life and death rebirth is is the circle that's the cycle um and there the fact that there's a three is a terrific powerful number that we see all the time in literature and in the bible both old and new testament naturally um Not that there's anything religious here, but it is significant. You know, there's the Alpha, 
there's the omega, and then what's in between there? What's the Greek word for in between alpha and omega? Does anybody know? I, I don't know. But I, I wonder if it's to see if something like that is going to come back. Because things do happen in threes. Things do happen in threes in Star Wars. So it, much. it might just be a coincidence. Uh, as my wife would say, Dan, I think the curtain's just yellow. But <laughs> no, I don't think so. And there's, well, Somebody there's chose always, that color. Somebody chose that color. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Another thing I want to talk about in this, uh, I really, I like Echo so much. And he is used pretty sparingly uh, in seasons two and three. And I like, one of the things I really like about Echo is that he's missing his right hand. It's a disability, you know, in, in a way. But it's not. And the fact that he is able to use uh, his appendage on his hand to go into these, and you know, this R two D two used to be the go to for this kind of stuff, right? There is a a plug in R two D two goes over there. He uses one of his attachments, and he's able to break the code or make sure that the the trash compactor walls don't smash Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Princess Leia or whatever the case may be, help fix the hyperdrive in the Millennium Falcon. And this is not a droid, it's Echo, who has some droid aspects of him because of the horrific things that he went through during the Clone Wars. But the fact that they're using a character that has um, a, a disability, so to speak, or um, he has a different skill set, right? Different abilities is, is what they would say uh, if in, in the world, in a school system, right? And the fact that he is a hero and able to use that, I just feel like that's a really wonderful, subtle, empowering thing that we don't talk about enough. Yeah, he definitely turns it to a positive. At one point, he's like, that's impossible. It's like, not for me, right? That he, he definitely looks at it as almost like a superpower. Yes. Yes, it's, it's, not, it's not ever used as a negative thing. It's, it's, very, it's a very empowering thing. Mason, uh, you are very active at your school. Uh, working with kids with different abilities. Uh, had you ever thought about that with Echo? And, and and what do you see when you see Echo? Yeah, it's really just a... Sometimes people can have disabilities that can help them and help them get friends in life. And people with disabilities are normally the nicest people you'll ever meet. That's true. And, and, I, and I feel like that's very well said. And I feel like Omega... Uh, Omega is so warm and kind, but every time she sees Echo... I think more than the rest of them, I mean, she hugs everybody, but she, she and Echo had just this great, great bond. And, and he puts himself, talk about into the breach, he puts himself inside that space station with that big uh, Jawas-esque vacuum cleaner that we see in the sand crawler, sucks up those astromechs, and then presumably he sneaks up there too. It is a great moment of espionage, and Star Wars is full of moments where we're breaking into facilities. The Death Star, of course, is the one that springs to mind. I think, what is it, every episode of Rebels or every other episode of Rebels are sneaking <laughs> into some sort of Imperial compound. Uh, I just, I really like how Echo was used here, and I like the fact that he's such an asset. Yeah, there's there's obviously a gaping hole with tech gone, and mm -hmm. it just, it you can feel it as a viewer that, this just doesn't feel whole. This group, this three, there's you're missing right. something. And I mean, a part of me wishes that Echo would just be on the show more. But it's the way they've used him. I think is brilliant. That you see him come in and like there's a sigh of relief and like yes, Echo's back. I love this mm -hmm. character so very much. And we've seen his incredibly long journey to this point. Um, but yeah, he's such what a great character and Terrific. so well used. I agree. I agree. And I still think he has the coolest armor. And it's like that helmet. I don't know. Uh, Mason, what's another uh, part that you want to talk about from the episode? Um, let's just talk about the Bad Batch infiltrating the Imperial. The space station? Mm -hmm. What? Tell me some highlights from that that you liked that you thought were cool or exciting. I liked how Record dealt with the officer. <laughs> talk about it. I like, um, he's like, come this way because you need to verify something like a code. And about the ship, and he says, "Right this way," and he lets him go. And 
he's walking in front of him, and then while he's checking something on his like iPad tablet thing, um, Wrecker goes behind him and uses his left hand and punches him and knocks him out. Well done. Well done. And I really like, did they say, where's your commanding officer? And he says, uh, commanding. Is that what, is that right? Is that yeah. right? <laughs> Wrecker continues to be hilarious. That, yeah, that whole sequence is great. And, and I didn't talk about this last week, but I, I really am enjoying Imperial officers with beards. It's really, that was a little weird for me too. We've and then, never yeah, seen I'm okay that. With that now. Two yeah. episodes in a row. It reminds me of a Walt Disney World when you when because I worked there uh, in the nineties, and you weren't allowed to have facial hair because it was clean shaven, and then it suddenly was well you can actually grow a mustache because Walt had a mustache, and now they don't have those those particular grooming guidelines anymore. But I wondered. I feel like the Empire is so staunch and strict, and you don't see anyone I don't believe in the original trilogy that has facial hair. Do we? No officers uh, that I can think of. No, I mean, you have, um, what's the guy that wears the white? It's in the Clone Wars. We see him at the table. Yularen? Yeah, yularen has got a mustache, but I think that might be it. And he had that in. Oh, um, a nozzle has a mustache, too. Oh, okay. So there are a few, but no full beards. No, 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 no. It's very minimal. Yeah, very neat here, and tidy. So here suit is my favorite $5 word for someone who's hairy. Uh, I don't know. I, I when I saw it last week when they were on uh, that planet uh, with the, with Juggernaut, and then this one, I like to think of it as if you're an Imperial with a beard, you're not expecting to be um, any kind of inspection anytime soon. But this guy is on the base itself, so it's nothing really to analyze, look into. But I just I just found it really sort of interesting. Well, All right, Craig, what's, beards. Yeah, uh, yeah, Rampart, and just everything yeah. with Rampart on that, Please. like he this kind of gallows humor a little bit, like oh yeah, we're all gonna die and. But just the way he he pulled rank a couple of times, which was pretty great to watch him bluff his way through that, like lieutenant looking at you know looking him up and down. Uh, he played his part pretty well in that. So I I like I just I love gallows humor. Period. So I just like to see that, uh, and that's in, you know that's the thing that's been in Star Wars for a while. So it's just kind of interesting to see an Imperial use that. Yes, it has, and uh. His whole like, I can't wear this. I, I'm not a captain. I was a vice admiral. He he pulls yeah. like this. He's trying to pull rank because he's still got that hoidiness about him. And I'm so important. I was I was very high ranking in the empire. Uh, and then when he gets when they actually are there and he first has to use that, he pushes the bad batch aside and talks down to this uh, captain and says, you know, let's talk to Governor Tarkin. And then, of course, when you hear that name, you're not going to mess with mm-hmm. that. You, no one's going to mess with Tarkin. Even Vader doesn't mess with Tarkin. Uh, so, and then he turns around. And he says, "What does he say? Gosh, I've missed this. Yeah. I've, I've yeah. missed this. I love that. I, I never thought I would say it, but I really, I really am enjoying Rampart. He, he's a blast. I mean, the voice acting is terrific, but uh, the way he is carrying himself, his arrogance, but also at the very end." Like that's panic. You don't, I, I don't remember seeing panic. Now it's not like he's a, a, a profound character that we've spent a lot of time with in the history of star Wars, but he's freaked out and he's scared. And that little element of humanity, I think makes him really interesting. Yeah, Mason, I agree. About, go ahead, Craig. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I also, I just like seeing the, uh, the rapport with, with the bad batch. And there was the one other thing was where they wanted, he wanted him to call him sir. And I think it's Hunter's like, yeah, that's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why is he doing that? <laughs> it was, it was pretty funny. Uh, Mason, what do you think about Rampart? Yeah, I think it was very funny in this episode and he was very enjoyable. He's terrific. Uh, is there Mason, is there another aspect of this episode that you want to bring up? No, there isn't. No, I the the only other thing I really think that's important is I think one of the big themes here is trust and faith. The the big challenge, and this comes up several times, and it should, is can they trust Rampart? It's a big risk, right? He tried to kill them for a couple of seasons. It's hard to sort of forget something like that. Uh, he is an Imperial through and through. And there's this really great moment where Hunter and Rampart are talking right before they're about to go into this space station. And he's going to say, look, the Empire betrayed you. We saved you. 
try to think of that before you betray us. And Rampart says, I'm here, aren't I? And for whatever reason, when that happened, I wasn't worried anymore. And I have no reason to trust Rampart either, but they do. I'm not sure where that comes from. It was just that blind faith. But I really found it fascinating that that we're in this place. And Star Wars is constantly asking us to look at people who you can't or shouldn't trust and to rethink them differently. And I applaud them for continuing to, to push that theme forward. Yeah, I just think of the line from The Empire Strikes Back where, where Leia asks Han like, about Lando, do you trust him? No, but he is my friend, which I've always thought was a really interesting line in the way that Han <laughs> defines friendship as not need, necessarily needing to include trust. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. But yeah, you, you, you should trust your friends. <laughs> now, think. yeah. It's, it's, so Lando, you couldn't trust. He was a good guy. Obviously, he more than made up for it. Rampart, not so much. But that when the Empire turns on his people, and they do it all the time, it causes conflict. Uh, so the fact that they are, are not subtle about reminding us, and rather astutely, hey, you know, there's a risk here too. Not only is there tension with getting those clamps onto that shuttle before it goes to light speed, or Omega trying to break into that panel in her cell, but just trusting Rampart is a risk too, because at any point on the space um, station, all he has to do is say, hey, this is Clone Force 99, you want to capture them, and he could try to levy that to get back into the Empire's good graces, but maybe maybe he knows better. I mean, the, the Emperor is who turned against him. If the Emperor turned against him, first of all, he's lucky to be alive, although he doesn't quite realize that. But there, there is something there that makes him interesting. And and that's that that is why I think Rampart is great, besides his gallows humor and besides his terrific accent. The fact that he's just not a typical Imperial adds a nice layer to this that I was not expecting. All right. Yeah, is I there just, anything I else we like want his, to talk about? Yeah, I was just I just like his bluster. That yeah, and it, it's a little empty, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Well, Craig, is there any other key points from this episode that you want to talk about? I, I don't. I don't think so. I think that we've covered covered most of. Them. Oh, the one last thing I did think of it. It yeah, was yeah. the op- the opening scene, the music in that scene. Oh, heavy synth. I mean, it was like John Carpenter. Yes. Was what I immediately went to is like eighties horror. Mm-hmm. Was and I'm like and I'm watching this and I'm like I enjoy this and it doesn't feel like Star. Oh wait, now it feels like Star Wars. Uh, like Kevin Kiner is just continually rewriting the rules of what. Counts mm-hmm. as Star Wars music, mm-hmm. uh, but it set the mood the mood beautifully. So I was very much enjoying that. Yeah, I, last week on Juggernaut, I, I I I talked about that. It reminds me of John Carpenter. It reminds me of Stranger Things. Yeah, there's just an eeriness there uh, that really amps things up, and it makes you feel tension. In fact, if you, when you watch The Dark Knight, uh, Christopher Nolan's magnum opus to me, The Dark Knight, every time the Joker is on screen. And the more the tension builds, they just almost like push on one note and they let it rise and rise and rise. And it just, you don't realize it's happening, but it makes you feel on edge. And that's what happens at the beginning of this. And it's great. And honestly, if we didn't have it, um, you'd be worried. But I think that adds to it. Because I think we live through Omega. And Mason, you probably agree with this too. I think we live through Omega. And if Omega is not scared, then I don't feel as scared. To me, it's like being on... um, an airline or on, on a plane. If the flight attendant isn't worried during turbulence, then I'm not worried during turbulence. Omega doesn't seem to be worried during the turbulent time. So there we have it. All right. Well, I guess let's just give our, our letter grades and in final thoughts on this, Mason, let's uh, kick it off to you first. Okay. I love this episode a lot. So I'm just going to give it a solid a for all of the, music the scenes and how they did rampart in this awesome a but not an a plus mm-hmm. okay excellent craig so first off i'm going to say you should watch all of these episodes more than once because i've changed my opinion the second time really and i've changed my opinion talking to you guys about this episode i was initially at the beginning of this episode was going to go b plus but I, i'm going to round it up to an a because there i think 
I'm finding there's more things I enjoy about it. You remind you guys are reminding me of things that I enjoyed and shedding some light on things that maybe I didn't quite catch the first time. So solid A. All right. I'm glad. And, and I appreciate the honesty and the perspective because I, I agree with you. Uh, sometimes these grow through the viewing. I will say I've watched this episode three times and it's an A plus for me every single time. And I don't just throw out A pluses, but this episode made me feel so that's why it was white knuckle. I, it made me scared. It made me feel very suspenseful. I almost couldn't look like uh, sometimes it, Mason, you know, like we'll watch a, a exciting sport event, a sports event with your mom. And so she'll like look away from the screen. Cause she was so <laughs> nervous about what's going to happen. That's how I felt at the end of this. And I'm so glad. I mean, you know, we've read and consumed and watched and enjoyed so many great stories in our lifetimes. And the fact that Star Wars can still make me feel that way and still throw in an interesting um, aspect of this with Omega. And then you've got, you know, can we trust Rampart and a, a mellow crosshair trying to um, just be in the moment and doing a beautiful job. But they're balancing a lot of personalities here. And with a gorgeous tapestry of what feels like death, a Death Star infiltration where they're sneaking in, even in that little that little uh, room where they stun that officer and the whole background looks like they're in the interior of the Death Star itself. Just magical in that ending where they just they hook on and zip the light speed and boom, it's they go to black and it's over. Magnificent. Magnificent. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> you know what else is magnificent? Talking Star Wars with Craig Dickinson and Mason Sir. That is what is magnificent. Mason, I played basketball with you on the court. I know you're on the basketball court. Are, are you Are you on any other fields uh, this summertime? On the baseball field. On the baseball field, too. That's right. Mason is, um, I'm biased, but Mason is, is an excellent basketball and baseball player. He works really hard. Uh, he's a great teammate, so we're very proud of that. But another fun thing that Mason has brought to the table, uh, Mason, is, as some of you know, is quite the, quite the Fortnite player. He's got his own YouTube channel which took a break during school because you have to have your school priorities first. So that's very good. Um, but talk to us about the series that you just finished and, and give us sort of a sales pitch of why we should watch it. Okay. So I just finished it last night. It's called avatar. The last airbender. Um, it just came to Fortnite, and I thought, Oh, I might as well watch it. And then I started watching it. And I thought this is okay. Then I watched a few more episodes and it took me probably about, five, six days to finish it. I wanted to watch it so much. And there's three seasons of it. And so I finished it in like um, less than a week. And so mm -hmm. I think you should try it. And so much of the Mason it's his favorite show ever, right? Yep. Craig, have you seen Avatar The Last Airbender? I have not, but my kids have watched it multiple times and have raved about it many, many times. So I've heard vicariously that it is fantastic. All right. I've only seen a handful of episodes here and there in passing. I'm telling you, buddy, uh, this is not Star Wars related. It's terrific. It is terrific. And at one point, Mason came to me and he said, hey, Dad, Dave Filoni wrote this episode. Mm -hmm. And then you start to see the connection. So, that, you know, we're not, this isn't become coffee with, with Aang, but it's terrific. Make sure you watch it. Make sure that after that, but before that, you should already be doing this. You got to subscribe to Craig's podcast. Craig, please tell us about what's going on. Uh, with your great podcast and, and where they can find you in the show. Oh, thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, Reading Between the Reels, we're out every other week. And actually, by the time this episode drops, we will have an episode that just dropped the day before. We just uh, did an episode on Sherlock Holmes from 2009 with Robert Downey Jr. Nice. Looked back at that. Yeah, we. I've been wanting to do a Downey movie for a while because Oscar fever and all that good stuff. And then this one's directed by Guy Ritchie, who, who's doing... Uh, the minister, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. So timing-wise, that worked out pretty well. Uh, but yeah, we've been having a lot of fun with that. We're going to do Blade Runner 2049 in a couple of weeks, Dan. So you might have to check that out maybe to join in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, because uh, yeah, that that was a fun episode we did. But Justin missed that, so he's back for this one. Okay. But yeah, we're, we're 
we're everywhere. You listen to podcasts on all the things. And uh, yeah, we'd love to love to hear from you guys. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here. Move along.